Okay guys and girls, I'm sure you've missed these flipped classroom videos, so I have a new one for you today. Uh, this one is on the flow of matter and energy in ecosystems, and it is a Prezi presentation that will hopefully present the way it is supposed to. But we shall see. If it doesn't, then we'll think of something else to do, won't we? There we go! Alright, so like I said, uh, this is on the flow of matter and energy in ecosystems. Now, first, a little bit of background. Most of you guys probably remember this. Uh, the main source of energy uh, on planet Earth is from the sun, at least when we're talking about biological processes. And uh, many of you have told me this already. Uh, energy moves up food chains, but not all energy makes it from one level to the next. That's why we use little arrows to go from grass to rabbit to wolf and the arrow is always pointing toward the mouth that is eating it because that's the way the energy flows. But every single bit of energy from that grass does not make it to the rabbit and every single bit of energy from the rabbit does not get used by the fox. And this means that each level supports less and less organisms overall in most cases. But before we get to that, our levels of our uh, uh, ecosystem, and you need to make sure these are in your notes if they're not already, are thus. Uh, producers are, uh, they make food from the sun's energy. They're plants. And primary consumers are animals that eat plants. They're also called herbivores. Now, secondary consumers, they eat herbivores. And tertiary consumers uh, eat those secondary consumers. Now, tertiary, don't forget, is just a fancy word for the number three. Now, when we talk about consumers, uh, they have several different categories. Carnivores are animals that eat other animals. Uh, your household cat is a carnivore. You can tell because he has big, long um, canine teeth. And also, uh, canines, to a certain extent, are uh, carnivores. But they go a little bit more toward omnivore, especially now that they're domesticated. Uh, an omnivore is any kind of animal that eats both plants and animals. You're an omnivore in most cases, unless you're a vegetarian. Uh, bears are omnivores. Uh, a lot of animals that... Uh, scavenge are omnivores, but a lot of animals that scavenge are also this next word, detrivores. A detrivore is any animal that can eat, that eats dead animals and or plants. Um, they also can be decomposers if they break those uh, plants down to their component parts or those animals. Now, depending on the situation, um, animals can be primary consumers or secondary consumers or uh, sometimes can even be secondary or tertiary consumers, but usually they'll fall into a uh, herbivore, carnivore, omnivore category. But some that are omnivores can also be detrivores. And some that are carnivores can also be considered detrivores if they're just eating dead uh, animals. Now, uh, the nitty gritty of what we're doing today that's different than what we've done before is uh, the organization of this energy flow into pyramids. Now, this is a picture of an energy pyramid. As you can see, producers are at the base. Uh, then you have primary consumers, which are herbivores. Then uh, secondary consumers and then tertiary consumers. Uh, at this point, they're at the top of the pyramid. It can go up more levels than tertiary, but since most examples usually just go to the tertiary consumer, I'm gonna show you this way. Now, uh, if I give you a problem where there are more levels than this, uh, that to do the math that I'm gonna explain in a minute, uh, you just continue doing the same thing I'm gonna describe to you. Uh, now, before I switch to the next picture, notice producers are at the bottom and they are the largest part of the pyramid. They are the base. Now, energy pyramids are going to always have this shape. They're going to be larger at the base and get smaller as you go up because producers are the base of your ecosystem. Without the producers, as we said in our activity we did last week, everything else will die out because they all depend on the energy that the producers get from the sun to make fruit food. Now, here's how the flow of energy works, and this is the math part, but before you freak out and have a conniption fit, realize this is not hard math. This is just percentage math. Now, only 10% of energy transfers from level to level. 90% is lost. Now, notice how I put that in quotation marks. Now, the uh, law of conservation of matter and energy says that you can't uh, create or destroy energy. It just changes form. So, when I say lost, I don't mean that it goes on vacation. I mean that it's given off as heat. And uh, a lot of times you can see this effect in you know more warm-blooded animals. So some of that energy, just the process of eating and getting that food to the point that you can use it for energy, makes uses about 90% of it. So the organism can only harness 10% of it as it goes up from level to level. So look at the picture that's on the left. Notice that these numbers on here, uh, the producers, 
they have a thousand kilocalories of energy available. Now you'll see kilocalories as the unit that you use for this. So whenever you do these problems, do not do not forget to put your unit at the end. That KCAL is important. But let's get back to the math. Producers have a thousand kilocalories. The next level up, primary consumer, they only get a hundred kilocalories from those producers they eat. Now, the way that you do this math is there's an imaginary decimal point at the end of every number. For each level you go up, just move the decimal one place over to the left. So if you look at the numbers as they go up, a thousand at the producer section, then only a hundred makes it to primary consumers. Then that decimal goes over one more to make 10 kilocalories at the secondary consumers and over even one more for the tertiary consumer. Now, if there was something that ate that barn owl, then you would take the decimal point that is at the end of the one and move it over to the left one more and whatever ate the barn owl would only get 0.1 kilocalories from that barn owl after it ended up digesting it. Now, those are not the only pyramids we're going to talk about. Those are the only ones you have to remember any complicated math for. Not that percentages are super complicated, but you know, some people are better at math than others. But uh, this is a pyramid of biomass. Now, uh, biomass is explained this way. Now, it represents the total weight of each level of the ecosystem. Okay? Now, what it, it does, it compares uh, the masses that each level support. And the big thing you need to know on this is to notice the humongous decrease from level to level. The producers, uh, they're saying there's 10,000 grams per meter squared, which would be like if I cut up, uh, took a meter stick and cut a big square of grass that was one meter by one meter by one meter by one meter in the square up and weighed it. Okay, so that's, that's where they got that 10,000 number from. But the big thing to know with these is just that each level you go up, there's less and less biomass. Now, this is the case if it's, most of the time, if it's a terrestrial, you know, on land ecosystem. But there are cases where it is inverted. Now, in aquatic ecosystems, this is the biggest case. And it's because the producers, the little photosynthetic bacteria uh, and other microscopic organisms that provide the producer level in this ecosystem are teeny tiny little microscopic things. So even if there are billions and billions upon them in the water, the weight is very tiny. So the uh, fish that eat those uh, little microscopic organisms are much bigger. I mean, whale sharks are one of the hum most huge fish in the world. Sorry, the biggest fish. Let me use a better vocabulary word there. But they survive on krill, which is tiny. Okay, uh, so a aquatic ecosystem where there's not a lot of plant life that is getting used since it's in the open ocean is going to have this inverted pyramid, which I think is kind of neat. Now, along with pyramids of biomass, there is a pyramid of numbers, and it works a lot like a pyramid of biomass, but instead of giving you a number that is a, the amount of matter that's in a certain area of the, of the uh, ecosystem, they give you numbers of organisms. And they can be regular pyramids, like this one on the top left, uh, with the clover snail, the thrush, and the sparrowhawk, where there's less and less numbers supported at each level because you only get a certain amount of energy. Or they can be very weird shaped, like the one down toward the right. The one down toward the right has the oak trees and then the insects. There's a lot more insects that live in trees and then the woodpecker. So it is an odd shape. It's still called a pyramid of numbers, but the pyramid shape is kind of just a uh, word in this case. Okay, so in summary, energy flows in one direction from producers up the food chain, which is why that energy pyramid is that triangular pyramid shape. And that's how we represent it with the 10% going from level to level. So if I ever give you a problem with that, you'll know exactly how to put it together. Now the flow of matter in an ecosystem is shown through a pyramid of, num of biomass, and it can be shown through a pyramid of numbers. And those can be upright or they can be inverted, or as you saw with that pyramid of numbers on the last place, they can be kind of odd shaped. Uh, now each level is dependent on the levels below it to maintain a balance in the ecosystem. If you lose one level, uh, the whole thing will fall apart. So that's what you need to know about our uh, flow of matter and energy in ecosystems. We will be doing a couple activities in class to show how this works, but uh, these are the basics that you need for your notes. Now, make sure that uh, after you do this, you fill in the notes. I will put the address for the Prezi presentation in case you need to go back because you might want to just flip through this on your own without my voiceover, uh, and I will see you in class.